this fast and relatively short ruling, which we got today, is indeed consequential. It draws lines on how this year's election will run. It smacks down state efforts to invoke January 6th as a reason on its own to bar Trump from running at all. Today, the court ruled, quite simply, states do not have that power over federal candidates. Only Congress does. States have no power under the Constitution to enforce a ballot ban for insurrectionists with respect to federal offices. The highlighting there, I'll leave that up for a moment, is important because... If you understand or remember nothing else about all this, it's that states deal with states, but states don't have the same power to deal with federal offices. That is what the Supreme Court ruled today. And all the justices agreed on that point. It was one raised by Obama appointee Justice Elena Kagan during oral arguments for this very case. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. Kagan's question there, slicing through Colorado's argument, as well as some of the other technicalities in this case. Today's ruling built on that angle. The justice is noting there is no tradition of state enforcement of an insurrection disqualification against federal candidates in the years following the ratification of this relevant amendment. And they go on to write that that is a telling indication of a severe constitutional problem with states' efforts here. In law and history... That is just true. It was a new, unprecedented bid for states to try to take the terrible horrors of January 6th and then cite them for a potentially new power that states alone could decide who engaged in insurrection. That'd be step one. And then, two, states would bar federal candidates from those state ballots. Now, we reported on this at the time. We spoke to the Secretary of State for Colorado, Jenna Griswold, and discussed the fact that federal candidates being barred by states was not a thing. So legally, it didn't seem like something the Supreme Court would now make a thing in an election year, no less. Now today, I'm going to walk you through what happened because some of it hits one way and some of it hits another way. And I'm going to do it, I promise, right now in plain English. Today, all nine justices reached the same judgment. So that means the justices appointed by Trump and the justices appointed by Obama and the other presidents, they all actually shared the same legal conclusion, that at a time of great division and understandable cynicism about whether more and more rulings are based on politics and not any independent law, that this kind of ruling shows some cases turn more than on more than who benefits. In other words... You can't predict today's ruling by whether the judges were appointed by Obama or appointed by Trump or appointed by any other particular party, at least in what this ruling does. So that is a kind of good news. But there is a but. And I'm going to walk you through the other issue tonight. And we're not reporting on this because we want to or we welcome some exception to that good news. If the decision stopped there, if the justices had that sort of, shall we say, discipline, then that's all we'd report on, and we'd go right to our guests. But there's more. Because, separate from what you might call that good news for the rule of law tonight, there are actions and statements by this court which also reveal that that type of nonpartisanship only goes so far. So this court was unanimous in the outcome. That means unanimous in the judgment. But it was not at all united in how to make this ruling. In other words, what's in the ruling, what it actually says, how far it goes. All nine justices were able to agree to concur in the judgment. Indeed, some of the Democratic appointees made that point by saying we concur only in the judgment. That's how they put it. And that is because five of the Republican appointees seized on this state case to go way beyond the issue at hand, state power, and just add new rules that they made up today for what they say are the required treatment of potential insurrectionists in a federal context. Now, that's a sweeping and anti-conservative kind of judicial reach. It is also the kind of thing that these same justices who you see on your screen, the kind of thing they claim they're against. They've said that in their nomination hearings and other places. And one measure tonight of how far they went 
In other words, if you're watching this and you're saying, okay, the news anchor is, is saying they went far, Ari's saying they went far, even the Democratic appointees are saying they went far, but does that mean they went really far? Well, one measure of this is what Justice Barrett did. She is, of course, a Trump appointee. She concurred that the states do not have these powers, but flatly called out the majority for overstepping, for going beyond the necessities of today's case to limit how the Constitution can bar an oath-breaking insurrectionist from becoming president. Now, some of this debate does get into the weeds, and we can get more into the weeds later in the hour if, if you want to stay around with me. But for right now, I'll just tell you, the bottom line is, four justices concurred because they think the conservative majority used this case as a power grab in ways that would currently only help Trump. So Justice Kavanaugh went farther than he otherwise would because of who this helps, not because of a judicial or legal principle. That's sort of what the other justices suggest in their concurrence. And here's why. No other candidates have been indicted for January 6th activities. No other candidates face any credible criminal legal process about dealing with insurrections. So the fact that the court in the majority went well beyond what it had to do on the state power issue and started talking about new federal rules for how to deal with a potential insurrectionist, whoever that may be, when we all know who that may be. <laughs> it only may be Donald Trump. And I say that literally. It may be Donald Trump, or legally it may not. In other words, we are a nation of laws, and there's a criminal process to determine his guilt. But there's nobody else around who's saying, oh, God, oof, good. They made new rules making it harder to go after insurrectionists. There's no other uh, federal candidates for president in that position. That's one reason today's ruling is unanimous in its holding, but not some kind of purely nonpartisan kumbaya moment. And there's a second reason. It comes in the timing and some of the unusual action today. Let me put it like this. I'm here reporting to you on the news tonight about a Supreme Court ruling, but did you know the Supreme Court was not even open today? It was not in session? You may recall the Supreme Court is a special kind of body. It's not like the post office. It is open in certain seasons and on certain days, and other days it's closed. And that makes sense, because they hear cases and they think about cases, and then on days when it's open, they either meet or rule. Today was not one of those days. There were no meetings in the court today. There were no rulings read from the bench at all. Indeed, I will emphasize it further. As you think about what a big court day looks like, as you probably caught it on TV before, there were no reporters out front breathlessly awaiting the action out of the court. There were no news trucks or crowds like we've seen in active court days over the years. I could tell you I've actually been out front of that court on many days during the big session days. And it's a whole scene, let alone when the big decisions are expected. Those are the even big days often at the end of the term. It's a whole busy scene. That's not today. The court was literally closed today. And yet, and yet, this court and its conservative majority decided to do something different to issue a ruling today, even though, as I just told you, they were actually closed. The building was closed down. So what happened? Well, turns out these, at least these conservative justices, are highly attuned to certain electoral conditions, even as they keep claiming otherwise. Here's how The Washington Post reported this aspect today. The court clearly has a high awareness of the election calendars, and the justices took the unusual step of announcing this opinion on the Supreme Court's website on a day when the court is not in session. Instead of using it, I should say, instead of issuing it from the bench later this month. They did not use the normal day to issue it. They will issue it later on the rest of the opinions. But today's opinion just went up online on the website. Now, the Washington Post is making an astute point here, and I emphasize it because it seems to pierce the other D.C. tradition of kind of usually taking the court at its word when it says, we don't do politics, and we don't think about external factors. We're just in here weighing justice and never looking at which candidate is affecting. Well, this court does do that, and lately it's been doing that a lot. Again, according to the evidence we have, like what the Post points out today about this unusual way to issue the opinion. The court rushed this ruling out on its website to get its answer about the ballot issue out there as Super Tuesday hits tomorrow. It is a result that the court has already been working towards by fast-tracking this case. They heard the original case and published the decision within one month. Just as in prior eras, 
Other courts have shown similar haste. If for Bush v. Gore, it took under a week from appeal to decision. Lawyers and judges know deadlines very well. They know how they can be met and used. And in a space where there's so much talk about uniformity, people getting equal treatment, we can see how the judges have been very noticeably treating certain Trump cases differently. There's the one that made all that news last week, Trump repeatedly losing his appeal of his immunity claims. Those are loser arguments. Just as I told you Colorado was unlikely to win because they had no precedent on their side, the immunity argument has no precedent on its side. There's no case you can point to that says that when you're a former president, you're an invincible superhero who never goes on trial. But the court is still delaying things in that case. Now, if you look at Trump's federal cool trial, it was originally scheduled to begin today. Jack Smith has won every round, reiterating Trump's not immune, like I mentioned. But this court isn't using the Colorado or Bush v. Gore calendar. In fact, at this rate, the court has added about three more weeks to the hearing of that case, from agreeing to hear it to the actual arguments, than the Colorado schedule that it used. Immunity arguments now set for late April. Now, I'll tell you as a matter of law, this is what the Supreme Court can do. It earns its title as supreme. We don't have an appeal beyond this. If the Supreme Court takes a case that's mostly about a state ballot issue and issues new guidance or rules, those become the law of the land, the final word, the supreme ruling. So I'm not telling you that there is some unprecedented judicial crisis today. Not at all. I am telling you that three justices appointed by people like Biden and Obama and even a Trump appointee had to call out the court for going that far. And I am telling you what could have been, apparently, a unanimous 9-0 moment for America wasn't. And the reason it wasn't tells us a heck of a lot more than just why Trump will stay on the Colorado ballot, which I told you was probably going to be the result months ago. What we learned today has some very profound repercussions. The Supreme Court building is closed today, but the Supreme Court is open for business. This is the front page of the big ruling today that will keep Donald Trump on the ballot. Uh, and as mentioned in our opening reporting, uh, there was a lot to draw from in this opinion. We're joined now by former Obama Acting Solicitor General Neil Kotchal and Supreme Court reporter Nina Totenberg from NPR. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Neil, your thoughts on what the court did and didn't do today? Well, I think the decision after the oral argument, Ari, which went terribly for the challengers to Donald Trump, I think the decision was expected. I think it was wrong because I do think that the 14th Amendment, Section 3, applied. I agree with conservative scholars like Bill Baud and Michael Paulson that it applied and barred Donald Trump. But unfortunately, the Colorado Supreme Court's decision here was not really defended in the U.S. Supreme Court. And that led the court to get out over its skis today in its legal reasoning. For example, much of the what the court said today is that the 14th Amendment is about restraining state power and states can't, uh, you know, police federal elections for disqualification as an insurrectionist. And I just think that's flatly wrong on the history because the 14th Amendment had multiple goals. One was sometimes restraining the states, but another, darn it, was barring insurrectionists from holding office, as what happened in 1868 Ohio. And of course, the amendment itself says that two thirds thirds of Congress can lift a disqualification. So there's always a federal remedy against a rogue state or something like that. What really, I think, happened is that people knew Donald Trump couldn't get two thirds of the House and Senate to remove a disqualification as an insurrectionist. So I think it's um, an unfortunate but expected decision today. What do you think about the message or, or perhaps warning uh, from the concurring justices, Neil? Yeah, I think, you know, the Supreme Court, um, you know, works best when it doesn't just reach and decide issues, that it, you know, cares a bit about its legitimacy. The most important book in constitutional law written in the last hundred years by Alexander Bickel basically said the court preserves its legitimacy by not deciding things. And that's traditionally already how the court operates. But now, as our colleague Melissa Murray calls it, we have the YOLO court that's reaching out to grab issues. And here, you know, that three-judge opinion by Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, um, and Jackson said on page two, a really stark warning. It said the court today is protecting not just itself, 
but the petitioner. And they didn't name who the petitioner was, but the petitioner is Donald Trump. And so what they said there is that the court went out of its way to protect Donald Trump and for future legal proceedings. And that, to me, is a fairly scary prospect, the idea that the court's reaching out and deciding momentous issues without the benefit of briefing or concrete case in front of it. Yeah, you mentioned that, and I'll say that by way of introduction to Nina. Uh, I, I, I've been very clear on air with viewers that there wasn't a lot of precedent for states doing this. So I, I expected it to lose badly. And Nina, as you know, with uh, nine in the, in the judgment, that's, that's pretty clear. Um, and yet we can also learn tonight that the court didn't stop there. I mean, talk about a win. You could have had what a per curiam 9-0 unified opinion. Uh, what a nice way to start the week or the year. Um, but it appears that five justices, absent Trump justice appointee uh, Barrett, um, wanted to get more done uh, for their agenda or however they put it or what they say in their view of the law was necessary. So uh, your view on, on all of this, Nina? Well, I think that the the answer to this, to some extent, is in the weeds. And I'm not going to go in the weeds except to say that the court not only um, said that Donald Trump couldn't be thrown off the ballot, which there were lots of liberal scholars who agreed with that. But it also said, yeah. made law, or tried to make law anyway, that said, um, that made it very difficult for any insurrectionist, no matter if they'd been convicted of insurrection, to be thrown off a ballot. Because it said that, the court said that, uh, Congress, only Congress can ma can make this law. It can't be judges, for example, except, of course, the Supreme Court. And it also put very severe limits on what Congress could do. So it sort of made it doubly difficult for, for future situations. And so I think that the you, you do see something of a court that, on some issues, is very aggressive. And you've seen that in other areas where there isn't even a decision by a court, and they take the case to review it. Now, that's weird. Yeah, weird is a, a, weird is a nice way to put it. Uh, some would say that that's nice uh, outside. <laughs> It is. Well, and you, and, you know, you've always been a nice person, as best we could tell <laughs> uh, in, in your work. But, you know, uh, some would say that it's uh, potentially an overreach or an abuse of the great unreviewable powers they have. Um, we've all made reference to the weeds here. Uh, for anyone watching, wondering what is our aversion to gardening? You know, what's the deal? What are we afraid of? Um, some of the technical and dry details of what ultimately was debated over today don't matter in the main. They certainly haven't come up that often in American history, which is why we're not going deep into them. Uh, but I will read from how the uh, concurrence criticized the, the mostly conservative majority, saying, look, the majority reaches out to decide questions not before us and forecloses future efforts to disqualify a presidential candidate under this provision. In a sensitive case crying out for judicial restraint, it abandons that course. And so, Nina, one way to say this is whether or not people see some potential validity to um, potential validity to what the conservatives thought they wanted to get to, they clearly didn't need to. Uh, and because it only benefits, as I mentioned in our setup tonight, people possibly accused of insurrection. It doesn't look like something that's going to matter to that many candidates. It looks like something to help this potential uh, defendant slash Republican nominee Trump if he if he gets the nomination, Nina? Well, it also means that uh, people who were running for federal office who might have been um, in the Capitol and have broken into the Capitol on January 6th, some of those people run for office. And you can't get them mm. off the, the... If they're running for federal office as opposed to state office, you're not going to be able to get them off the ballot. And that is something that, at least arguably... The writers of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War specifically had in mind that they didn't want to have people who were uh, deliberately uh, threatening the, the legitimacy of the United States and its government being able to run for office. And that meant Jefferson Davis, for example, but it could mean Joe Schmo, who's running for Congress. And so that's why yeah. it is important. And then it's important also because we've got the immunity case coming up. and. 
you you can see that there are ways to decide that case in a more limited way and ways to decide that case so as to preserve a lot of a former president's ability to be immune. Right. And that's where you say that whatever one thinks of, say, the five who ruled today, um, if the concurrence is at all correct, that they have stopped being judges and they are thinking about short-term politics and who may benefit or who to help or help the person who appointed them, uh, the whole lesson, the founder's lesson, the whole republic we're dealing with is whether, uh, even by that kind of short-termism, they don't understand that if you super empower people to come into office to be immune forever, if you change that law because you want to help your buddy, uh, you may find that you're living in a, in a dictatorship someday, uh, and not because you meant to, but because you were being so blinded by potential partisanship. At least that's between the lines of the concurrence, potentially. I want to thank no, uh, Nina Totenberg and Neil Kotschow. I'm over on time, I but go ahead actually, if you have a quick thought. I, I, my quick thought is that this is not, at least, this is not an overtly partisan decision, at least not to the people who made it. That doesn't mean that their gastronomy we view might view as different but i don't i don't think of them as partisan actors but i do think that they were trying to get rid of this as a question that would come up a lot in front of the court and they very successfully did that in the immunity case there are going to be different questions and there will be different actors and the per the biggest player there one suspects will be brett kavanaugh who more than any member of the court has had experience with the president on a daily basis as his chief of staff every day working with George W. Bush, and f ever since he's been on, uh, been a federal judge, has had very mm -hmm. distinct views about um, immunities for a president. 